she had come up yesterday that he's not able to make it today. So I would like to welcome you. Well, articles on these forums um, around the country. And we also do a few webinars now, so that's one of the reasons for videotaping, because this will be available um, on the Internet and through, our, through a webinar. So I'd like to welcome you um, and hope that you get uh, uh, some really good information. We're here to, this is an educational forum. It's sponsored by um, Genentech. Somebody made a comment to me uh, in Instagram that that meant it was an infomercial for Genentech. And I responded back, no. Actually, Genentech makes us sign something that we will not mention their product at all. And we even have to tell physicians that are speaking not to mention their product because there's rules about that. So it's definitely not an infomercial for a Genentech product. They do make a number of products that are very good for autoimmune diseases, but they have absolutely no part in any content. They fund it, and that's the last we hear from them. So, but we do like to acknowledge their their because we would not be able to do it without their support. So, I, I just wanted to bring that up because somebody instant messaged me that, and I wanted to clear that up. So. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to start out with uh, Rita Baron Faust. Rita Baron Faust is a seasoned health educator, an award winning medical journalist, and author of six books on women's health, including The Autoimmune Connection, essential, which is essential for women on diagnosis, treatment, and getting on with your life. I like that in getting on with your life. We've really added that. <laughs> Ms. Baron, Fa Baron Faust is currently an adjunct. Professor at St. Francis College in Brooklyn Heights, New York. And for almost 20 years, she has served as a volunteer educator for the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association, known as ARDA, which is much easier to say. So I'm going to use ARDA from now on. Uh, speaking at public forums and events around the country. So she's been a volunteer for us. Uh, I, want, I would like to acknowledge that none of our speakers are paid an honorarium. They're donating their time today in kind, and I think that's very nice that they can come out or travel and spend the time uh, on a Saturday volunteering to bring patient education uh, to to all of us patients out there that and families that really uh, want to have this information. So, Rita, you're on. Thank you very much. But I'd like to start out, even though this is about women, most people don't really have a definition of autoimmunity very quickly. Most people don't have a handy definition for autoimmunity that they can pull out of their pocket from the same doctor. So this is it very simply. When we get a cold or an infection, the immune system usually fights off the invaders. It's like an army. They're, they're there. Sometimes, though, instead of targeting the infection, the viruses or bacteria, our immune system attacks cells, our healthy tissue. And this autoimmune attack is believed to result from a lot of different things. Genetics, inherited predisposition, if you have family members, hormones, and environmental exposures. You're saying, oh, is that pollution? Environment means anything in your environment, and that can be a virus. And frequently, we're exposed to a virus that has been associated with autoimmune disease. And about half your risk is from the environment things around you. Why is that important? Because they will, it can affect the function of genes that signal your immune system cells to go on the attack. So if your cells get a signal from the environment, whether it's a virus, 
smoking for women who have rheumatoid arthritis, they go on the attack. And autoimmunity causes almost 140 diseases. And in fact, we, we have estimated about 50 million Americans. Common autoimmune diseases include type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and thyroid disease. Thyroid disease is so common that if you're in a crowd of people, you could tap the person ahead of you on the shoulder and say, pardon me, do you, lady, do you have thyroid disease? And on all likelihood, they'll say yes, because it's that common. 75% majority of people affected by autoimmune diseases are women, often during their prime reproductive years. Now, these are chronic, lifelong diseases. They're controllable, but you can't cure them or get rid of them. Someday we will be able to predict them and treat them so we can eradicate them, but not right now. And they can affect any part of your body. And this is a, a schematic anywhere from the head to the toes, and they do. So the problem for women is that you go to the doctor and you say, I have a symptom. And sometimes the symptoms are not specific to a disease. It's not like a heart attack where you're clutching your chest. Oh, it's obvious this person's having a heart attack. Here are symptoms that might be dismissed. Vaginal yeast infections, you have type 1 diabetes. You'll likely get a lot of yeast infections. Incontinence in multiple sclerosis. Night sweats in Crohn's disease. Foot pain in RA. When I interviewed Kathleen Turner, the actress for my book, she, was, she had terrible foot pain. And the doctor looked down at her feet and said, I think you need to get rid of those shoes. And that was not her problem. The problem was the disease, not her shoes. Other symptoms, dry eyes, dry mouth, dry vagina, and Sjogren's syndrome, and scleroderma. Irregular periods, infertility. These are not specific to a disease. So part of advocating for yourself means knowing as much as you can about what's going on with you. Sometimes we do these surveys every five years. Today it takes about three years and four doctors to get an accurate diagnosis. We started doing this ser these surveys. It took five to six years and five to six doctors. And the symptoms get dismissed. Most women are told they were overly concerned with their health. Have you ever been told that? Oh, you know, you're, you're overly concerned. But what happens with a delayed diagnosis is disability. Autoimmune diseases are among the top 10 leading causes of death among American women ages 65 and younger, and the fourth largest cause of disability for women of all ages. For example, between 2000 and 2015, Systemic lupus erythematosus was the 10th leading cause of death among young women and 14th among women ages 25 to 34. So if you get a delayed diagnosis, you get delayed treatment. And Dr. Fox will be talking about this. Here are the autoimmune diseases. They are, as you can see, they are much, much more common in women. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That's your underactive thyroid gland. It is incredibly common in women. Systemic lupus, you can see, nine to one. For every nine women, one man. And it's more severe in men because of different factors. But these are the most common diseases. So why are we more at risk? Well, for one thing, we have stronger immune responses. Anyone who's married and your husband gets a cold, you know this. 
It takes him a week and he's blowing and complaining. You seem to be over it in, in, in a week, in two days. We have more autoantibodies. These are the substances that react in the immune system. We have specific molecular on and off switches. There are things in our body, little chemicals, antibodies, other things that turn off and on the disease. We have two X chromosomes. We're the double X's, and that plays a role with men being an XY makes sometimes the disease is much more specific. Effect of female hormones. This is still being debated and researched. Fetal cells from past pregnancies. They hang around in the bloodstream. We're more sensitive to environmental factors. Stress, anxiety, all more common in women. And this contributes to a special vulnerability. Why female hormones? Estrogens may stimulate your immune response. Turn it on, turn it off, and can affect how your disease progresses. High levels of estrogen in pregnancy may even trigger remission in RA and multiple sclerosis. How is that possible? Hormones, the treatment for autoimmune diseases, anti-inflammatory. Well, female hormones are steroid hormones, too. So, in certain cases, they can make the disease worse, and in others, they can make it better. Low levels of female hormones after menopause may make rheumatoid arthritis worse and functional status and disease progression. So, that's why we're still debating and researching this. Progesterone, that's your PMS hormone. High premenstrual levels can worsen MS or myasthenia gravis. Androgens, we have no hormones too. And they can act as immune suppressants in some diseases, such as lupus and Sjogren's. And prolactin, you say, oh wait, no, that's breastfeeding. It's in your body for other reasons too. And you see elevated lupus the levels seen in lupus and other autoimmune diseases. I just said fetal cells from past pregnancies. We call this microchimerism. These cells cross the placenta and remain in your bloodstream for as long as 20 years. Well, think about this. That baby is half you and half someone else. So it's technically an alien being, and your immune system is not attacking it. So those cells, which are, have the genes of one person and the genes of another, will get a reaction from the immune system. This, is being, this has been studied for more than 20 years now. Double X chromosomes in women, XY in men, may promote self proliferation and that may make a disease worse. The excellent genes. You're saying, well, what does that mean? It means if you're a woman and certain diseases are activated by an X gene, your female gene, it can affect your immune system. So you could have a family history that looks like this. Multiple autoimmune diseases, not necessarily the same one in every family member. Your grandmother may have type 1 diabetes. Your mother may have rheumatoid arthritis. You may have thyroid disease. And you're going, that makes no sense. Yes, it does. They're all autoimmune diseases. That's what connects them. The most common symptoms of autoimmune diseases are also the most common complaints among women. Fatigue. We're not talking about being tired. We're talking about feeling like your feet are encased in cement. You can't move. Joint pain. Have anyone wake up with achy, achy joints this morning? It's a common symptom of aging. It's a common symptom. You, you banged your knee. You banged your hand. It's a common symptom. And depression. 
those are all three common symptoms to all of the autoimmune diseases. But if you go to a physician and you say, uh, he says, well, what brought you in today? What's wrong? Well, my joints hurt. I'm, t- uh, I'm fatigued and I'm depressed. Does that tell him anything specific? No. And that's the problem. Fatigue is seen in just about every autoimmune disease, and we're not talking about being tired. We're talking about being unable to function. Joint pain. Just, it's not just in diseases that affect the joints. It's seen in other things. Would you think a, a GI disease that affects your digestive system would produce joint pain? It does. Some of the inflammatory substances related to those diseases produce joint pain. Depression. This is a tricky one. You go, oh, well, yeah, I've got a, I've got a disease. Of course, I'm depressed. It doesn't really work that way. It's seen in many diseases, and it's often the first symptom of multiple sclerosis. And there was a study just last year that linked depression with an increased risk of of lupus in women. Well, depression is twice as common in women. It's not as simple as the math, but these are connections. Diseases cluster. If you have thyroid disease, you could also have type 1 diabetes. And now many physicians are having women tested. If they have type 1 diabetes, they're also giving them a thyroid function test. Why there are special concerns for women with these diseases. You can have low libido, infertility, depression. Am I describing an autoimmune disease? No, I'm describing a nonspecific symptom. So you can see the problem here. Graves disease and overactive thyroid anxiety, mood swings. Does that relate to a specific disease? No. So you have to know what your specific ailment causes. Rheumatoid arthritis can cluster with all of these diseases. Sjogren's syndrome, dry eyes, dry mouth, autoimmune premature ovarian failure, infertility. You say, how is this all connected? Your immune system affects these things. In RA, women can have reduced fertility. They try to get pregnant, and they don't know why they can't. An increased risk of osteoporosis. Well, that's partly because you get corticosteroid drugs as an initial treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, and they can cause bone loss. Lupus can cluster with thyroid disease. You see why I'm saying if you go out in a crowd, you tap the person in front of you and say, pardon me, do you have a thyroid problem? They'll know like most likely they will. Systemic lupus can cause a lot of, quote, female-related problems. Irregular periods, miscarriage, high blood pressure in pregnancy, Disease flares during pregnancy, earlier menopause, these are all things that affect women. And it's more common in severe in African Americans. We just don't know why. We have associations, but we don't really have tight cause and effect. Sjogren's syndrome, dry eye, dry mouth, can cluster with a lot of other diseases. It's also Dry eyes also occur in aging. So none of this is very simple. So you have to be able to be specific when you speak to a physician. Sjogren's dry, scratchy eyes, chronic dry mouth. I've had trouble convincing doctors that I have Sjogren's. They tested me. They said, oh, we don't have the autoantibody, but I know what I'm experiencing. Scleroderma clusters with Sjogren's too. Has anybody ever experienced Raynaud's? You get your hands turn color in the cold. 
I've been at conferences where I had to stick my thumb in a cup of coffee to get it to be its normal color. Normal color. Scleroderma, there are special concerns for women. Again, fertility. Dry vagina. Now, if you complain to your doctor about that, what would he say? Menopause. We're not talking about menopause. We're talking about an autoimmune disease. Inflammatory bowel disease. Nobody connects the gut with other parts of the body, but it does affect it. So, IBD could have chronic diarrhea, abdominal pain, unexplained weight loss, joint pain. The same inflammatory substances in the body causing that disease are also inflaming joints. Crohn's disease is a whole laundry list of things that cluster with that. You see, autoimmunity is not a simple problem. It can affect any part of the body and cause many, many different diseases. Special concerns for women with inflammatory bowel disease, again, very specific to female sex. Bone loss due to malabsorption, but also due to corticosteroid treatments. And joint pain, well, your joints hurt. What's somebody going to tell you? You have arthritis. Celiac disease, where people react to gluten. This is the only autoimmune disease where you can actually cure yourself by going on a gluten-free diet. It's the only disease that there is a surefire way to treat. You have, it's not easy. You have to avoid all gluten products and wheat, other things, but it clusters with other diseases. So you could have all of this at the same time. Celiac disease, I'm reacting to gluten when I eat bread. Well, I may get a misdiagnosis of irritable bowel. Women frequently are told you, you have an irritable bowel. When it's not, that's not what's going on. Anemia, when you menstruate, sometimes women lose a lot of iron and they become anemic. Bone loss due to malabsorption. If your gut isn't absorbing the calcium and other nutrients it needs to keep rebuilding your bones, you can have bone loss. And what's the last thing on the list? Depression. We're not talking so much about a circumstantial, situational depression. We're talking about something that's happening biochemically in your body. Multiple sclerosis. Clusters with hypothyroidism. Underactive thyroid. Fibromyalgia, which is widespread systemic pain. For a very small subset of patients, epilepsy. Interstitial cystitis. That's a really inflamed bladder. And you're going, how does that relate to multiple sclerosis? It's a disease that clusters with it. Special concerns for women with multiple sclerosis, depression, fatigue, infertility. These are not some of the classic symptoms that you would think would be caused by multiple sclerosis. Hot flashes can make it worse. Heat makes MS worse, makes the symptoms worse. But there's good news in all of this. Now that I've scared the hell out of you, we may have, in the near future, predictive tests. If they can find autoantibodies in your body, they say, oh my goodness, maybe these symptoms are related to this. Or we can predict it. This is happening in lupus and other diseases where they may be able to detect things in the blood, immune cells, so if you know that you're more likely to de develop an autoimmune disease, maybe, just maybe, we can prevent it. And there are more genes being linked to it.
type 1 diabetes and thyroid, for some reason, are genetically linked. And we're developing really better therapies that target specific antibodies. They're not just, call, you take two aspirin, call me in the morning. It's not just prednisone as a universal treatment. It's, a, it's treatments that target a specific antibody that's in your system. So we're going to have a lot, we already have really good therapies for autoimmune disease, and we're getting more every day. And ARDA is just about the best resource that you could find. You can call them. They've got all the latest information. They're all on top of every medical study about autoimmune disease. And uh, I was told I had to keep it short, so I did. Um, I will be here later, so uh, if you have questions, please I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. What an informative talk. It clears up a lot of information, doesn't it? The questions that you may have had. Uh, I'd like to introduce now um, Dr. David Fox from the University of Michigan. He's going to talk about the importance of early diagnosis. Um, you already saw that that's a major problem in autoimmune disease, is getting an early diagnosis. It can take three, three, more than three years and up to um, three years three or four doctors. We know that from the survey that we do. Uh, Dr. Foss is a graduate of Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard Medical School. Following internal medicine residency and rheumatology fellowship at the Brigham Women's Hospital, uh, he joined the faculty of University of Michigan School of Medicine in 1985. Dr. Foss is professor of internal medicine and from 1990 to 2018 was Chief of the Division of Rheumatology. In addition, he directs the University of Michigan Clinic, Clinical Autoimmune Center of Excellence. Um, that's an NIH-funded project, I believe, and there are several of them around the country, so that's quite an honor to have been funded for that. Um, in 2013, Dr. Fox began the Frederick G. L. Hotwell and William D. Robinson, MD Professor of Rheumatology. Dr. Fox's research focuses on defining the characteristic, characterized, and defining and characterizing pathways of the human T cell activation, which is involved in autoimmune diseases. In determining the role of these pathways in the pathogenesis of autoimmune disease, investigating T cell interactions with the synovial fibroblasts, understanding the role of interleukin-17 in arthritis, and exploring novel approaches to the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma. He is author of more than 230 scientific papers, book chapters, and has served on the editorial board of the Arthritis and Rheumatism uh, as an associate editor and section editor of the journal of Immunology, and as an associate editor of the Journal of Clinical Investigation. Dr. Fox is really a nationally known expert in autoimmune disease. We very much appreciate him coming to speak to us today. I've known Dr. Fox for a long time, and I think this is the second or third or fourth one he's done in Michigan here for us. But Dr. Fox. Thank you, Virginia, and also thank you, Rita, for uh, a wonderful talk that really set up a number of points for me to uh, go ahead and develop further and amplify. And I, I had one thought, um, Rita, as you were mentioning that celiac disease was the only autoimmune disease that we could cure. And really, I think that's because it's not truly an autoimmune disease, because what the immune system is recognizing and, and going on the attack uh, against is not um, so much your own body tissues, but the 
uh, antigens in wheat and other grains, the gluten, gliadin. And so it's really caused by something coming in from the outside. So more, in a way, a, a blend of an allergy and an autoimmune condition. And then if we can remove the uh, agent that stimulates the immune response, namely the, the wheat and, and the other grains, then the celiac disease will, will die down. But the problem with autoimmune diseases is the immune system is attacking uh, substances in your own body, and you, you can't you know, remove those. So the stimulus uh, persists. Uh, and and the um, uh, has to be treated in other ways. So let's see. I need to get my uh, presentation up there. There's a title on this. So um, Virginia mentioned that um, although the uh, expenses for this uh, uh, event were supported by a pharma company, that um, this should not be taken as an infomercial for any pharma company. And, and I would say no, no one is asked to look at my slides or edit my talk. And if, if they tried to do that, that would be against all the rules and, and they couldn't do it. So I have grant support mostly from the NIH and from time to time from a pharma companies, but that is not pertinent to what we're going to talk about today. So, a key reason for early diagnosis being important is that autoimmune diseases cause permanent damage. And um, some of the diseases are very organ specific, and so we're worrying about damage in, in one organ, and others can affect the whole body or many different organs. And, and we have to be on the alert in multiple directions. So rheumatoid arthritis, um, we know that rheumatoid arthritis, if left to its own devices, is going to result in loss of cartilage and destruction of bone. And when that starts ha happening in your joints, and potentially in many joints at the same time, that's going to lead to deformities and to serious functional decline. It used to be that if you got rheumatoid arthritis, but that meant that there's a 60% chance that within five years you would no longer be working, and that the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis at whatever age it was made is associated with a 50% decline in your lifetime earning power from that day forward. Okay, that, that was, I would say, what you could expect up until past 10, 15 years or so. We're seeing a lot of progress in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, and um, rheumatologists are starting to be confident that we're turning the corner on this uh, level of disability that used to be the norm for this disease. To get accurate statistics on a thing like that, you have to follow a large number of patients for a long period of time. So I wouldn't say that's totally proven, but my sense is that we're seeing far less disability, and in fact, I have patients with very long-standing rheumatoid arthritis whose disease got better enough on intensive treatment that they became undisabled, if you will, and after being out of the workforce for a number of years, were able to get back into the workforce. And that's very gratifying when we can see that. Now, of course, some patients with rheumatoid arthritis have important involvement of other organs and tissues as well. So we can't just focus on, on the joints, but the joints are where the, most of the action is in most of the patients. And then we get to lupus, and lupus can affect many, or I would say any organ or tissue throughout the body, and it's very different from person to person, and as Rita mentioned, is a worse in young black females. The, the, president, the, the prevalence of lupus in African American uh, women is about one in 500. So this is not a rare disease in, in that group of people. And it's particularly severe uh, in that group as well. So one of the classic things we worry about in lupus is kidney failure. And kidney disease can be kind of a silent thing. You don't have a lot of symptoms that your kidneys are failing until they fail. You start retaining 
of fluid, uh, urine output goes down. By that point, it may be too late to save the kidneys. Uh, lupus is also associated with lots of vascular complications. So women with lupus, say between the ages of 30 and 40, and women that age, in that age group do not often get heart attacks. But if they have lupus, they have a 30 to 50 fold increased chance of getting a heart attack in that uh, in their 30s. So it's big time uh, risks. And so the stakes are very high for identifying disease and treating it before some of these complications can occur. Now, scleroderma is possibly one of our, or the worst uh, of our systemic rheumatologic autoimmune diseases, both because it involves internal organs and ways that cause those organs to fail, like scarring the lungs or um, damaging kidneys or heart, and in some patients, seriously compromising the ability to absorb nutrients from the GI tract. But also, scleroderma has been so far the most difficult of our rheumatic diseases to treat. That is starting to change. We're, we're starting to see some progress. It seems slow still, but I think there is some progress in the treatment of uh, scleroderma. And part of that involves understanding that even in patients who might look exactly identical, there could be different immune molecular mechanisms going on in different subgroups of patients requiring different types of treatment, very specific treatment for the exact immune abnormality in that patient. We call that targeted therapies, or you could call it personalized medicine. And I think that is going to be what allows us to make the progress in treatment of scleroderma, which will then raise the stakes for early diagnosis because the more uh, uh, effective the treatment is, the more important early diagnosis becomes. Now, vasculitis. Is, is that a term that anybody's ever heard of, vasculitis? Some people have, yeah. There are many kinds of vasculitis, and they can affect uh, all sorts of organs and tissues throughout the body, and can present in very sneaky ways. And I'll show you a, a case story of one of my patients just to illustrate that. And uh, I think here is where diagnosis is particularly difficult. And if patients are lucky enough to get to an expert early on, uh, typically a rheumatologist, they stand, I think, a better chance of getting a correct diagnosis and then getting treatment instituted. And the vasculitis diseases represent an area where there has been quite a bit of progress in treatment in the last five or ten years. So getting the diagnosis early and which kind of vasculitis it is this treatment is different somewhat between the different kinds becomes very important. And then multiple sclerosis, Rita mentioned that a few times. Clearly, multiple sclerosis is a disease that damages the brain. It is episodic. It, it could um, start off with an episode of what's called optic neuritis, where the uh, optic nerve gets inflamed and you lose some vision. And then it could attack another part of the brain and you lose some of your balance and coordination, and so on and so forth. So um, there are treatments for multiple sclerosis. Getting the diagnosis early allows treatment to be started and can decrease the frequency and severity of these attacks and there, therefore decrease the course of the brain damage. So just illustrating what these diseases like to do if left on their own. This is a patient with scleroderma, we call it systemic sclerosis, cutaneous systemic sclerosis. So it uh, compromises the blood supply to the fingers. It uh, causes thickening and, and tightening of the skin so that the areas affected can't move properly and are very painful. And then it causes gradual loss of the tips of the fingers in some patients. So I, I have one patient with uh, systemic sclerosis who has no a uh, piece of any finger left beyond the end knuckle. The, the bone, everything has just been kind of eaten away by the, um, the circulation um, closing down, not enough oxygen going to the tissues, and gradually, bit by bit, the tips of the fingers die and fall off. And it's a terrible disease to, uh, to try to deal with. This patient 
Cleo has obviously rheumatoid arthritis, um, many, many years of rheumatoid arthritis leading to that kind of deformity. And obviously, there's, there's basically no uh, gainful employment that somebody with hands like that can, you know, can, can reasonably be expected to do. So that patient's disabled and at risk for all kinds of other complications. That used to be what happened to many, perhaps most patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And I've been in this long enough that I can remember back to the 1970s when I was in medical school, and then the late 1970s, I uh, did residency and fellowship. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis looked like that, and there wasn't much we could do to prevent it. That has changed uh, remarkably. The uh, list of effective medications for RA is very long, and they can be combined uh, in, in very effective combinations. So that I would say only five to ten percent of patients currently have disease that's so resistant to all of our therapies that, that this is going to happen to them despite treatment. But there are some patients that don't get diagnosed soon enough, and we know that the damage can occur within the first few months. So uh, being able to to avoid this is a critical. Di uh, early diagnosis is absolutely critical for our patients. And this is a, a brain MRI from a patient with multiple sclerosis. And all of those white patches there, the, those are areas of the brain that the MS has attacked in this patient. And they're damaged and they're never going to be normal again. So um, some of the obstacles to early diagnosis were mentioned already by Rita. And part of the problem is that for most of these autoimmune diseases, we really don't have an exact um, definition of the disease because we don't know the precise cause. So we found out a lot about a disease like RA in terms of you know, which molecules does the immune system use to inflame the joints, and TNF is one of them. So we use anti-TNF uh, biologics. They work very well. So we know lots of characteristics of of these diseases in ways that are useful to treatment. But in terms of knowing fundamentally what the disease is, how it started, what the exact cause is, how to cure it rather than just treat it, we're not there yet. Hopefully in the next 20, 30 years, we're going to make that kind of progress. But um, when you can't define something precisely, it, it gets in the way of early diagnosis because we, we have these long-winded definitions with lists of features, and, and it becomes very confusing, especially to the non-specialist. So we have these things called classification criteria. So how do you define rheumatoid arthritis? Well, you could technically you could do it on this 10-point scale, and if you have six points or more, you have rheumatoid arthritis unless some other explanation is apparent. So there's a wobble in, in that definition. And so what, what gets you points? Well, it's the number of tender and swollen joints, the titer of autoantibodies, rheumatoid factor, or anti-CCP, and um, non-specific elevations of inflammatory uh, parameters like the elicit sedimentation rate or C-reactive protein. So this really is a more complicated thing here in terms of applying this algorithm. So your target population in which you're going to consider rheumatoid arthritis are patients who have at least one joint with clear-cut inflammation. That's called clinical synovitis or inflammation of the synovial lining of the joints. With that, synovitis not better explained by another disease. So that's the person you consider rheumatoid arthritis, and then you apply this point scale so if they have one large joint like just a knee, well, RA presenting in just one large joint, that's not too typical. You get zero points for that. Uh, two to ten large joints, one point. Small joints like in the fingers and the toes, very characteristic, two points. More small joints, three points, five points. You know, nobody who's seeing patients in their office is, is going to be able, from a practical uh, point of view, to apply uh, a diagnostic uh, algorithm like, like this and sort of get through, you know, really evaluating the patient and, and get through their busy day in their office. So 
these classification criteria are really only useful for research purposes to define in a clinical study who can be called rheumatoid arthritis and gets into a clinical trial and, and who uh, would not get into it. So, and then what are we left with? How to define rheumatoid arthritis? Well, there is no definition really other than this, and that's a big problem. Imagine a disease that we know so well and we, we don't have a definition for it. So, um, on top of that, with any of our diseases, the symptoms are highly variable. So there are some patients who are normal when they go to sleep one night, and the next day they wake up and they have flagrant rheumatoid, or in the middle of the night they wake up and have flagrant joint swelling in 20 joints, and they have fully developed rheumatoid arthritis that came on clinically in one day. And then there are other patients in whom one joint may swell for a week and then return to normal, and another joint may ache and not swell, and it plays games like that over months, years even, and finally a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis is made. So that would be what we call the variability of symptoms and clinical presentations, and certainly lupus uh, is a master of disguise and variability as well. And as was mentioned by, by Rita, you know, sometimes the, the first symptoms are just the same things no matter what the disease is. So joint pain, fatigue, a Raynaud's phenomenon can occur in many autoimmune diseases, and yet most people with Raynaud's phenomenon will never get a systemic autoimmune disease. So how to, how to factor in that symptom is quite complicated. I mentioned this variable duration of the prodromal phase. So how, when does an autoimmune disease really start? So we know now that patients who are going to get lupus or patients who are going to get rheumatoid arthritis, that they may have the characteristic autoantibodies associated with those diseases months, even years, even five years before they ever feel sick with the disease, before a joint begins to swell. If you would have had a blood test um, years before, you could have suspected that they would get the disease. And in fact, there are certain combinations of levels of blood test abnormalities that close to 100% guarantee that a person will get uh, a specific disease. So we can now predict fairly well rheumatoid arthritis if we were to go and test everybody and also uh, analyze their family history. So should we do that? Well, we should only do that if we have an intervention that can prevent it. Otherwise, we're just worrying everybody and spending a lot of money. So we'll come back and talk about that in a little bit. So um, then we get into, you know, which of these diagnostic tests, like the autoantibody titles, are really useful and which of them are misleading. So um, the issues to consider here are what we call sensitivity and specificity. So for instance, if you consider the, the test called a rheumatoid factor, uh, a test that's been around for you know 50 years or more, um, and many patients and physicians still equate having rheumatoid factor with having rheumatoid arthritis. Well, there are both issues of sensitivity and specificity. So there are patients with what is called seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. In other words, they have RA, or what we call RA. Maybe it's really a different disease, but for now it's called RA. But they don't have rheumatoid factor. Lack of specificity is even more important because it turns out that if you do have rheumatoid factor, only one in six of those people has or will get rheumatoid arthritis, and the majority will not. With um, lupus and the ANA, it's even worse. Um, ANA positivity is very common for many reasons, including how the immune system deals with certain infections. So one, only one out of 50 people who have a positive ANA have lupus or will get lupus. Yet um, many in, in the you know, general community 
when they see that ANA test, they, they assume that automatically equates to lupus, and a lot of doctors uh, share that confusion as well. So we need more specific tests, and in some cases we have them now. And when we have a test with high specificity and reasonable sensitivity, that's very, very helpful in diagnosis. Now, another issue that's important to stress is that very subtle symptoms can be the presentation of life-threatening diseases in the case of autoimmune diseases. And that's certainly anything that can cause kidney failure, the, um, the symptoms can be very subtle. Fatigue, um, the most common symptom, and, um, and sorting this out is, is truly difficult. And yet, latent symptoms of incapacitating musculoskeletal pain can occur in diseases that are fundamentally non-organ damaging, such as fibromyalgia, which is a pain disorder. So the, the intensity of the patient's complaint does not correlate with the severity of the underlying illness, at least in terms of life-threatening or organ-threatening uh, dimensions of the underlying illness. And so um, this uh, creates issues in terms of triaging and, and ranking patients who are referred to uh, rheumatology offices. There is a serious shortage of rheumatologists in the entire country, which is not going to go away anytime within the next 20 years at least. So um, when, when patients are referred to, uh, to rheumatology practices, often the, um, the rheumatologist office is trying to figure out which are the urgent ones and which are not the urgent ones. And, you know, it tends to be the patient that complains the loudest to their primary care physician that the primary care physician's office would rank as the most urgent patient. And that may be somebody with fibromyalgia and no autoimmune uh, disease. And patients with fibromyalgia need to be treated and can be treated. But uh, if you had a patient with early RA or lupus, or vasculitis that was threatening the kidney or some other organ, that it's even more important for the expert to make that diagnosis and get that patient started. So the shortage of rheumatologists really creates a, a bottleneck and a potential place where serious mistakes can be made in terms of um, missing the chance to, to make an early diagnosis. So let me um, illustrate some of these points with a, a case history of one of my patients. So this is a 68-year-old lady with a cough. So her difficulties began, I'm quoting directly from my initial clinic note, which was I think in 2015. Her, so her difficulties began in May of 2015 with development of a persistent non-productive cough. Along with the cough, she noticed steadily worsening fatigue. She lost 10 pounds and her appetite is poor. She has felt warm and flushed at times, but has not documented any fevers. In addition, she has noticed muscular pain in her legs when walking since July. She has not had back pain or change in sensation in her legs. The patient also mentions that she wakes up at night feeling sweaty, which is abnormal for her. So, go figure, you know, what is the disease that this patient has? So, okay, more information. There is no exposure to pets. She did travel to China, had a GI illness there, but just for one day. Review of systems is negative for any nasal sinus or hearing symptoms, no change in their vision, no headaches, no scalp tenderness, no history of gastrointestinal reflux, but recently on a proton pump inhibitor as a possible treatment for the cough. But some patients who, who reflux um, present with cough as a symptom of it. Up to date in health maintenance, etc. So she's been investigated with laboratory work and imaging studies. Notably, her CRP is markedly elevated to 9.2 with normal less than 1.0. Albumin low at 3.2, and, and so that, that is a sign that, that there's some kind of serious chronic inflammation going on in this patient. Hematocrit 30.6, so significant anemia. White cell count rate is not normal. Chemistry panel generally unremarkable with borderline creatinine and one, that's a measure of kidney function, and one is the upper limit of normal for women. Her ANA was positive at 1 to 160 with a negative rheumatoid factor. 
um, and other chest motions. There's normal CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, which was unremarkable. So what's wrong with this patient? What condition does she have? So, um, impression, my initial impression that chronic systemic inflammatory process characterized by weight loss, anemia, high CRP, problem fatigue, infectious autoimmune and neoplastic and cancer possibilities are worthy of consideration. The only specific clue to an autoimmune process so far is a low titer AMA. There is little, if anything, in the history to support a systemic autoimmune disease and nothing specific on physical exam to further focus attention in that category. Nevertheless, we will undertake a thorough laboratory evaluation for lupus, vasculitis, and other autoimmune conditions. So her creatinine was repeated, and it had crept up from 1 to 1.1. So it's now abnormal, but the least abnormal, you know, just a touch above the, the, the upper limit of normal. And also, there, what we found is microscopic hematuria, meaning a few red blood cells in the urine. Therefore, a vasculitis with renal involvement, such as microscopic polyarteritis or polyarteritis nodosa, is possible, although her low blood pressure is not typical for these conditions. And then additional results come in. And now, um, here's where our testing starts to help us. Because this T anchor, so an anchor is an anti neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. This is a test that um, can associate with a certain kind of vasculitis. So, I, I sent her right away to my colleague in nephrology and told him I want a renal biopsy in this patient. So, um, here's the results of the kidney biopsy. 18 glomeruli. Glomeruli are filtering units of the kidney. Our present. Four are obsolescent with an ischemic pattern, and five have cellular crescents several of which have evidence of all of these things that they mentioned there. But what this basically means is that half of the filtering units of the kidney are toast, okay? So half the kidney is, is toast already. And remember that she presented with cough, fatigue, a little of this, a little of that, um, and a creatinine which was at the margin of abnormal and then crept one tenth of one unit of a unit into the abnormal range, and yet she has a process going on in her kidney that has already cooked half of her kidney. Okay. Um, so and and the rest of the biopsy gives details like that. So renal biopsy showed severe kidney damage, even though her blood tests were consistent with near normal kidney function. ANA was positive, but was irrelevant. Okay, she does not have lupus. This kidney biopsy pattern is not lupus in the kidney. Instead, what she has is this anchor associated vasculitis, a disease term, microscopic polyarthritis. So, Virginia, is that in your list? Is that in your list? Okay. And which was, and this is a vasculitis that can affect any organ, but in this patient, it was detected only in the kidneys. Okay. So, Right away, we unleashed pretty um, strong treatment on this patient, prednisone, cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, and rituximab. And she got a little worse before she got better, reflecting what was cooking in the kidneys. Currently peaked at 1.55, and now five years later is 1.18, and very stable, and she feels fine, and you know, is, her disease is fully controlled. But if there had been a delay in diagnosis, Given what the kidney biopsy showed, even for a few more weeks, month or two, that patient probably be on dialysis now. Okay, so so that's the challenge that we have is such subtlety of symptoms. Now, rheumatologists are trained to figure this kind of thing out, but most other physicians are not trained and, and just can't do it. And there's just not enough of us rheumatologists. So this is a a problem that. Um, doesn't have an obvious solution to have enough workforce here to uh, to handle all the patients that, that need that kind of attention. So let's talk about rheumatoid arthritis now. So this illustrates what happens in rheumatoid arthritis over the course of time. So this is the same finger 
joint x-ray um, after uh, six months of disease, 18 months, or say three years. So early on, the um, contour of the bone and the structure of the joint is normal, but there might be just a little soft tissue swelling around the joint, which you don't need an x-ray, of course, to see. You should be able to just tell that examining the patient. But there is what we call periarticular or juxtaarticular osteopenia. So the bone density has gone down near the joint. And we know now that bone density goes down in rheumatoid arthritis patients even before their joints start to be symptomatic. Okay? So um, how does that happen? Well, it turns out that one of the autoantibodies associated with RA, the anti-CCP antibody, can directly act on the osteoclasts, which are the bone resorbing cells, to activate them. And if that antibody is present, even before you have rheumatoid arthritis, your bone density is going down. So then, um, this patient either is not treated or doesn't respond to treatment, and so there is worsening on the x-ray that's taken a year later. And I don't know if you can see it from back there, but you know, when you look at a joint, the space between the bones is where the cartilage is. And when, this, when that space gets closer, it means that a lot of the cartilage has been lost. So the cartilage is being eaten up. And in addition, there's an area here on the edge of the bone that has become indistinct. You see there's a clear line there, but here it's kind of fuzzy in terms of telling exactly where the edge of the bone is. So that's the earliest form of a bone erosion in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. So sure enough, a year later, now the cartilage is completely gone, and there's a big chunk eaten out of this uh, bone here. This is a, a, a portion of the bone that's within the joint capsule, but not covered by the articular cartilage, and therefore the inflammatory synovial tissue can invade directly into the bone there. That's why the erosions in rheumatoid arthritis occur kind of on the sides first rather than in the middle. So this is what the disease will do, um, and these images reflect the underlying immunology and biology of what's going on. And the big problem is it can do this in 20, 30, 40 joints. So that's what we have to stop from happening in order to uh, prevent rheumatoid arthritis patients from developing destruction, deformity, and disability. Now, um, we also have to keep in mind that some patients with bad RA will have serious involvement of other organs. Five to 10% of patients with RA will have lung involvement, and uh, you probably don't have to be a radiologist or have a normal chest x-ray, you know, side by side with this to know that these lungs have something going on in them. And this is a, a interstitial lung disease is what this is called, and this is very dangerous. And um, it is an aspect of the management of RA in which we're not sure if any of the medicines that help the joint disease make any difference for the lung disease. So this is more like scleroderma, something that we haven't figured out properly how to treat yet. And in addition, we know that the incidence of cardiovascular disease and heart attacks is at least double in patients with RA compared to the general population. And what makes that even more troubling is that more of those heart attacks are occurring without the classic symptoms of chest pain. So, um, you know, the, the heart attack was mentioned earlier in the program as an example of a clinical situation in which the diagnosis could be obvious. But this study from the Mayo Clinic tracked the incidence of unrecognized heart attacks in patients with RA or without RA. And how do you tell if there's unrecognized heart attack? Well, if you're getting EKGs on patients, you know, every year or every few years, you can see the evidence of the heart attack that happened on, on the EKG. So if you, if you look at this curve, you see the RA patients are clearly tracking with almost twofold incidence of unrecognized MI compared to the control patients. Maybe they're so used to having pain in many places that the pain of a heart attack is, is not ranked number one on the list of pains in that particular day. So 
So there's, there's cardiovascular involvement and difficulty diagnosing it. So, um, and I mentioned that really that the onset of joint inflammation is not when RA starts. It starts when the immune system some years before begins to generate the abnormalities that can lead to joint inflammation. So, um, this is actually a very exciting concept because if we can predict and identify RA before its clinical onset, we can test strategies for prevention. And maybe we call that secondary prevention. In other words, that they, they really already had the disease immunologically, but we're going to prevent it clinically, which is what the patient would really care about. So we know that RA tests in families. We know it's in part a genetic disease. We know what a lot of those genes are. So clearly, genes are an important part of your predisposition to get RA or not. Smoking turns out to be very important. Very, very important. It's the, it's the leading environmental risk factor for getting rheumatoid arthritis. And it has been calculated that if nobody smokes, there would be one third less rheumatoid arthritis than there is in the whole population. So, in other words, one third of the entire set of factors causing rheumatoid arthritis is smoking. And that's a modifiable risk factor. And then the other key thing that can predict RA before you get it is the presence of the autoantibodies that, that characterize this disease. And so we talked about rheumatoid factor previously, but the problem there is it's not specific. It occurs in lots of other diseases, autoimmune and not autoimmune. But this anti-CCT or APA antibody, an antibody to something called citrullinated peptides. This uh, antibody occurs almost exclusively in people with RA or who are going to get RA. So if, if a patient goes to a physician's office and has some stiff or sore or swollen joints and they want to do just one test to know if, the, if RA is starting or not, that's the most useful test they can get. So let me just show you a little bit about how smoking and genetics interacts in, in your risk of getting RA. So this is data from Sweden. And uh, along here, along the, this uh, horizontal axis, you see no SE genes, single or double SE genes. What's SE? It's called the shared epitope. It's the um, peptide sequence in your immune system molecules called MHC molecules that um, turns out to be by far the biggest genetic risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis. So if you um, have one copy of this gene, your risk is up by twofold or more compared to none. If you have two copies, you know, you have two of each chromosome. So two copies of the risk gene, it's, it's up a lot more. Now, on the back here, you have smokers. So if, you're, if you don't have the genetic risk, but you smoke, you still have an increased risk to get rheumatoid arthritis. Very substantial, more than twofold increased risk. But look what happens if you have the risk gene and you smoke. The, the chance goes up exponentially or synergistically. In other words, it's more than adding the risk. It's kind of multiplying them. So if you have two copies of the gene and you're a smoker, you have a 15-fold chance to get rheumatoid arthritis compared to no copies of the gene and not being a smoker. And we know now that passive smoking is a risk factor for RE. It's not just active smoking. So if you grew up in a, in a household where your parents were smoking and as a child you had, were exposed to that passive smoking, we think that's an important risk factor to get rheumatoid arthritis later in your life. As important as any single um, risk factor that we can put our finger on now. So one more reason why smoking cessation is so important is anybody with a family history of rheumatoid arthritis, um, if they smoke, they, they better stop. Now, the risk conferred by the smoking does not immediately go away, but it lessens gradually over the years. So if you smoke, it's, it's still worth stopping. How about if you smoke and you get rheumatoid arthritis? Well, there is clear data now that 
continued smoking interferes with the effectiveness of all of our treatments for rheumatoid arthritis. So once you get RA, there is still a very, maybe even a more important reason to stop smoking. If so, the treatments will work. Okay, so I, I really want to stress the smoking issue because it's something that, in theory, we can control and modify. So um, this slide just illustrates all of the things that I just said. So, um, along with, with this information, there is a growing understanding that RA probably does not even start in the joints, okay? That the inflammation starts elsewhere in the body and at some point localizes to the joints. So, the uh, phase one is just having risk factors for RA. Phase two is having no symptoms but having inflammation somewhere. And that somewhere actually may turn out to be the lung in some patients, the periodontal tissues in other patients, and the gastrointestinal tract in other patients. But the best evidence actually is that RA may start in the lung. And once you know it, smokers will um, develop abnormal proteins in the lung that give rise to that anti-CCP antibody response first in the lung rather than in the joints. So, uh, in patients who are going to get RA but don't have it yet and don't even have the antibody in their serum yet, that anti-CCP antibody, if you induce sputum from those patients, the antibody is there in, in the lung in, in some patients who are in the pre-RA phase. So, uh, then at some point something localizes, begins to localize the process to the joints. It would be very important to figure out what those triggers are. And you start to have some stiff, swollen, swole and solar joints, but not enough yet to meet that, you know, classification algorithm that I showed you at the beginning. And then, finally, in the fourth phase, you have clearly identifiable clinical RA. Well, you know, we would like to treat it back here before it even turns into a clinical disease. And so there are now... Uh, pharmacologic trials starting and underway to try to do just that. So the idea is you're going to interrupt the autoimmunity and the inflammation in this intermediate phase before you have full-blown disease. And the way that you can select people to do that is if they have a clear, abnormal anti-CCP antibody. Because we know that if this, if this antibody is greater than two-fold normal, that you have a 50% chance of getting clinical RA within three years. That's a very important piece of knowledge that's been gained just recently. Um, and, and if prevention studies work, screening for this antibody would probably become a general health test part of the screening of the entire population. So this um, uh, trial called Strategy to Prevent Rheumatoid Arthritis or Stop RA is underway. The lead center for this is at the University of Colorado. And we are participating in this at the University of Michigan. Our site lead is Dr. Skupu, who is one of our rheumatologists. And so the hypothesis of this study is that an intervention in individuals who are at high risk for future RA will result in decreased progression to clinically classifiable RA as well as permanent alteration of autoimmunity. So the agent that we're starting with is a mild agent, platinum, hydroxychloroquine, or HCQ as we abbreviate it. And um, the patients who enter the study, they have to have the high titer of this anti-CCP antibody. They do not yet have inflammatory arthritis, enough to call it RA on physical exam. And then they're randomized in a blinded, placebo-controlled way to receive hydroxychloroquine for one year. Or placebo, and then they follow it for another two years. And so why are we trying the mildest thing at this time? Well, we're, we're treating patients who aren't yet sick, so, you know, we have to be gentle at least um, uh, to begin with. Uh, but also, that, that may be good enough at this stage where the burden of inflammation in the body is still fairly modest. So we will see how many in the treated group versus the control group go on to develop 
All right, we already know that about 50% in the untreated group will develop RA within this three-year study. So this is underway, and let's hope that it works. So how do you recruit these people? Well, out in Colorado, they actually have health fairs where the general public comes and gets a blood test for anti-CCP, and if they if it's high, they can go into the study. Um, they also we also can focus on first-degree relatives of patients, so parents or siblings or children with patients with um, rheumatoid arthritis, and patients who are um, referred to our clinic for um, you know sore joints but don't have RA yet on exam, but they have this test a positive, we can uh, offer them the option to go into this trial. So um, I've given you kind of some selected examples here of the importance of early diagnosis and now trying to stretch your concept of early diagnosis to even an earlier stage in the disease than, than we uh, currently define the clinical disease uh, as. And, um, I think the future is potentially very bright here, and if we can start to show that prevention works in one autoimmune disease, um, it's likely to be tried in others. So that concludes what I want to present, and I guess we'll sort of sequence into a question period. Thank you. Um, alcohol intake has been uh, looked at and is not a risk factor for RA. Um, there's even a borderline suggestion that modest alcohol intake is protective versus none. So, possibly, not possibly. Um, uh, the uh, data is not clear with respect to environmental pollutants. Um, one might suspect that what is at risk because of smoking might be um, similarly at risk because of some other environmental pollutants, but, but the, the numbers and the, and the studies are, are not there to, to prove that at this point. Yeah, and it's different, different things in different places. And so the risk factor and really the only risk factor so far is smoking. There's a lot of work going on in what's called the microbiome. So we, we have a um, fascinating collection of um, uh, bacteria and other organisms in our gut, but not only in our gut, in our airways, on our skin. Um, there are actually 10 times as many microbial cells in your body as mammalian cells, believe it or not. So we're, we're one big, you know, bacterial and viral zoo. And the idea has arisen that abnormalities of one or another of these microbiomes could underline what goes wrong with the immune system leading to an autoimmune disease. So people are working on characterizing the microbiome in many different autoimmune conditions. And there have been some abnormalities reported in RA and some proposed as specific for RA. It's still very early in this research. It's very controversial. There are lots of pitfalls in the work. I don't feel it's at the point where it's ready to um, present to a lay audience, but it's something to, to keep our eyes on, um, you know, what's going on in, the, in that microbiome. Yeah, I, uh, I, I have to delve through it. You know, the way the studies are presented is typically never smoker versus ever, versus current smoker. And sometimes never smoker versus ever smoker. Um, 
what can I say? I, I, we know that that the risk gradually declines with time from stopping smoking. So that would suggest that you know, the total amount of smoking versus current smoking, you know, is is, is the um, you know the, the real risk factor. But I, I don't think we have numbers to actually answer that, that question. Um, Yeah, the answer CCP, or it can be called ACPA, ACPA, which is anti-citronated protein antibodies. So this citrulline is an interesting thing because you know that proteins are made up of amino acids, and the amino acids are encoded by your DNA uh, with this triplet codon um, uh, system uh, that nature has for defining how proteins are made. And so there are 20 amino acids that are encoded by DNA, 20 different ones, and those 20 amino acids in various sequences and combinations make up all of your proteins. So citrulline is an amino acid that we can find in proteins, but that is not encoded in the genome. So how does that happen? Anybody know? So it's, it's a modification of another amino acid. So it's a modified form of arginine. Arginine is one of the 20 amino acids in the genome and codes, and proteins are built with arginines and with other amino acids. And then um, an enzyme can come along and convert some arginines to citrulline in the protein after it's been fully made. These enzymes are called peptidyl arginine deaminases, and they are induced to be present in areas of inflammation. So the um, presence of, of this process is called citrullination. It's seen in many different biological situations. But in terms of the immune system uh, recognizing or thinking that this is a foreign thing and ought to be an immune response to it and an antibody made, that is exclusive or nearly exclusive to rheumatoid arthritis. So if we really understand that whole process, it's getting us closer to understanding the cause of rheumatoid arthritis. But that, that's what this is. It's, it's an antibody to what we call a post-translational modification of, a, of, of proteins. Yes, and I think the fact that you know smoking's been identified just is so it's so prevalent, and, and we can measure it. So that's the environmental risk factor that, that we're aware of. But in other um, uh, disease, auto, other autoimmune diseases, there are probably other environmental factors operating in those diseases, and we're just not sure of them yet. In um, scleroderma, systemic sclerosis, there's been some epidemiology suggesting that certain chemical exposures such as pesticides may play a role in triggering that kind of disease. In one of the uh, vasculitis diseases, it used to be called Wegener's, it's now called granulomatosis with polyangiitis, GPA. Airway irritants and certain occupational exposures have been linked or suggested to be linked to that condition. The, the um, limitation is with some of the rarer diseases to get the, um, the amount of data that you need to be sure of a result is just a lot more difficult. But I, I think that the discovery of the smoking RA connection is probably going to be a, a model for a very important role of environmental factors of a variety of types in uh, many autoimmune diseases. And, you know, some of the autoimmune diseases um, are relatively new or are much more common than they used to be. So, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis was unknown um, until the early 1800s, which um, is when the Industrial Revolution was underway and also when tobacco had been imported from the New World back to the 
old world and, and was becoming much more uh, popular in, in Europe. You know, if you look at um, uh, the mummies, the preserved mummies from ancient Egypt, and they've all now had cat scans on them, so we know what kinds of arthritis existed in ancient times, at least in that part of the world. And there was osteoarthritis, there were um, infections of bones and joints, there was ankylosing spondylitis and spondyloarthropathies. Those, you know, go way back. We can't find rheumatoid arthritis in those um, in those uh, remains. So it didn't. It probably didn't exist um, in certain parts of the world uh, until recently. But other autoimmune diseases did. So this historical epidemiology can also, you know, maybe give us some interesting clues. So we're just at the beginning of understanding the environmental impact here. I think it's very important. One more question. Um, yes, for diseases in which you need to do something as drastic as a stem cell transplant, say, so you can replace the whole immune system by, you know, wiping out your bone marrow and, you know, putting in some, some new stem cells and letting it reconstitute. If we can cure a, or treat a disease by something that isn't that dangerous, you know, then the, the gentler the treatment, the better. But the autoimmune disease in which stem cell transplants have been studied and shown to work is um, scleroderma with lung involvement. So um, there, are, there are big published studies now um, funded by the National Institutes of Health that um, validate bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant as effective. Um, also, multiple sclerosis can be, can be treated that way. Um, Rheumatoid arthritis, it's been tried and actually doesn't seem to work as well in RA. In lupus, the results are variable. Um, from University of Michigan, we've had two lupus patients who've gone elsewhere for stem cell transplants. One, it worked well. The other patient actually got worse lupus afterwards and died. So, um, so, so far, MS and, and systemic sclerosis. Now, then there's the, um, the other... Uh, way that one thinks about stem cells is like to repair cartilage defects in joints. Um, so that's that's a, a that's more in the orthopedic um, domain. Um, it can work if um, there's a partially normal joint with, say, a divot out of it, and you can put the right kind of cells in there and regenerate um, something that's compatible enough with cartilage that it sort of fills that in and repairs the damage there. In rheumatoid arthritis, the cartilage is so damaged throughout the entire joint that there's no sort of uh, framework there to hold the cells in the right place to, to, for them to repair it yet. Plus, the underlying bone is, is uh, damaged and undermined. So it's not applicable for rheumatoid arthritis yet. It's more for certain kinds of osteoarthritis. Question back there. We use it to diagnose RA in patients um, in, who have inflamed joints or complaints suggestive that their joints are inflamed. The, um, the use to predict and study in the pre-RA uh, phase is, uh, is in the research phase at this point. But it's rheumatologists who are doing this research. No. No, it would be a, a routine blood test. A very commonly done test now, and, um, you know, part of the evaluation of, of, you know, does this patient have RA, that would be the first test we, we get. Question from here? Mm -hmm. It can, but it won't make a CCP test go negative. Um, you know, it would take a lot of prednisone over a long period of time, typically, to do that. In lupus, there are some blood tests that go up and down and respond to treatment and, and get worse. 
when the disease is flaring. Anti DNA is, is one of those, and that's a very important test we use to follow patients with lupus. The ANA usually persists at some level, and perhaps after years of good disease control may, may disappear. So, why some antibodies are more responsive to treatment than others is kind of a complicated thing that we only partially understand. Well, thank you, Dr. Fox. That's an excellent talk. Uh, we're going to break for lunch now. Um, if you have any questions for Rita, uh, just stick around a bit to, to answer them. But we're going to move out to lunch, and I think we pick up lunch uh, outside, and you can either eat inside at a table, or you can go outside. And then we'll reconvene for the forum. Thank you, Dr.